In video 25 of Tensor Calculus, we're going to follow up our last video and analyze how our invariant expression for the dot product applies to each of our sample coordinate systems. Here we have the fact sheet for Cartesian coordinates, but we thoroughly analyzed this case back in the last video. So there's really nothing to do except to uh, add this uh, fact to the list, and that is that in Cartesian coordinates, the dot product works out to be this no matter which of the four expressions we choose to use. So there's really nothing else to say. We'll just move on to affine coordinates. Let me start by talking about this particular form, UIVI, where one is contravariant, the other is covariant. This is going to turn out to be a trivial solution in any coordinate system because A dot B is simply going to be a combination of one contravariant component with one covariant component like this. And um, since there are no other factors involved, this is the form we're going to see for every coordinate system. It's only a question of how many terms. This is a two-dimensional example. Others would have a third dimension. Uh, likewise, ui, vi like this is going to be trivial like so. It's going to have a lower index and an upper index combined in each of the terms, just like this. And again, we'd have a third term if we're dealing with three dimensions. So these are very trivial. Therefore, the only challenge that we really have is uh, the ones where we include the metric tensor terms. So let's talk first about Z, I, J, U, I, V, J. What this formula tells us is that we need to iterate through all of the elements of our covariant metric tensor and uh, combine them with the appropriate vector components out here. So we're going to be using contravariant vector components coupled with the covariant metric tensor. And we just need to iterate through each one of these elements. So we start with Z11. We have A dot B is going to equal Z11, which is A squared, times the appropriate elements here, which would be A1 and B1. And we're dealing next with the Z12, which is AB cosine alpha. Since we're dealing with element 1, 2, we need the components A1 and B2. Then we'll deal with uh, Z21, which is AB cosine alpha. This time, because it's 2, 1, the components will be A2 and B1 like that. And finally, Z22 is B squared times A2, B2. And that's what it'll look like. Now, because the... Um, metric tensor is um, symmetric, these terms are always going to be the same, which means these will be the same, and we can simplify this a little by factoring that term out. So we could reduce it to this, A1, B1, and then this term AB cosine alpha factors out, giving us A1, B2, plus A2B1, that's this guy here, plus B squared A2B2, like that. So let me just slide down and show you the result, um, and you'll be able to see that uh, that's what we have here. Notice that we've got this expression is the one we had right here, and of course these two are what we talked about earlier. And then it shouldn't be hard to understand that this expression is just uh, resulting from this expression, Z I V I U I V J, and we're iterating through each of the components of our contravariant metric tensor. And you'll see those factors out front like this. This one is here, and this one's here. And just like before, we're able to combine uh, these terms just like we did up here. 
So, I think that's pretty much it for affine coordinates, so let's move on to plane polar coordinates. Now, based on our last discussion, you're going to see this is uh, going to go really quickly. We start by iterating through all of the components of our covariant metric tensor, and because it's an orthogonal system, only the diagonals live, so we're going to have uh, A dot B is going to start with Z11, which is 1, times components, and we're dealing with the contravariant components this time, A1, B1. And the only other term that survives is Z22, so it's R squared times A2, B2. We don't need to consider Z12 or Z21 because they're zero, and we're done with that. Now the other form we've already talked about, A1, B1, plus A2, B2, that's a simple one. And then A1, B1, like this. And finally, we're going to iterate through our contravariant metric tensor, but we're going to use covariant components. So this is going to be Z11 times A1. 1, B, 1, lower position, because we have the contravariant metric tensor, we have to have covariant uh, components, plus 1 over R squared, the only other surviving term here, times A2, B2. And uh, let's slide down and take a look at that. And uh, you'll see that's exactly what we have right here. Okay, let's... Uh, Look now at cylindrical polar coordinates. And again, we have uh, a system that is orthogonal, which means we have only diagonal elements in our two metric tensors. So I'm not even going to write down the results here. I'm just going to show you what it is, and I'm sure you'll be able to connect the dots. So all we're doing is walking through the elements of the covariant metric tensor, 1 row squared and 1, and combining those with the appropriate components of our vector. These two are common to all results, and this is just uh, using the covariant components coupled with uh, these uh, particular elements in our contravariant metric tensor. There's really nothing more complicated to it than that. So let's move to spherical polar coordinates, and again, it's a trivial exercise. We have diagonal elements only in our metric tensors. And so if we slide down and look at the result, it's uh, nearly trivial in that it looks like this. We walk through each of our metric tensor components down the diagonal and multiply by the appropriate vector components. And here we use the contravariate metric tensor coupled with the covariant components of our vectors like that. Okay, I think you get the idea. Now there's uh, one more thing I want to show you. So let's go back to the uh, drawing board on this one. Here we have a point P represented in plane polar coordinates. Well, suppose we have a vector at point P that looks like this. You know by now that in tensor calculus, we represent such a vector this way. We have basis vectors z1 and z2. Now these are covariant basis vectors. z1 is a unit vector. z2 has a length of r. And we use those in conjunction with the components of our vector to form a linear combination that looks like that. Now this representation is somewhat unique to tensor calculus. If you go out on the internet and search for a plane polar coordinates, you'll probably be presented with what I call a normalized form of plane polar coordinates, meaning simply that the basis vectors are unit vectors. So when you talk of plane polar coordinates, most people understand it this way. And where we have, it's a similar idea, we still have basis vectors pointing in right angles to each other, one along the uh, this direction, one this way, but the basis vectors are unit vectors, usually depicted as r hat and theta hat. And therefore, the linear combination is again similar to tensor calculus, 
looks like this. Now, if uh, you again go out to the Internet and look up expressions like uh, the dot product and gradient and all of those things, they'll probably be given to you in this uh, form using this representation. So as part of what we're doing here, I want to include representations for uh, each of our objects in what I call normalized form so that uh, you'll see that it agrees with uh, the, the published work out there. So to facilitate that, let me put up both representations together. And um, what we'll see is that this particular term and this particular term represent the same thing. They both represent a vector that goes out to this point right here, from here to there. Now this term and this one represent the vector that goes out this way. So the two terms are equal, but um, the factors are not the same. Because the basis vectors are not the same length, then we have to make an adjustment in the components as well. So um, the first one is pretty easy because z1 is in fact a unit vector and so is our hat. So it's easy to see that a1 is equal to a r. On the other hand, um, when we look at uh, these two guys, z2 is not a unit vector. It uh, has a length of r. So it's pretty easy to see here that r times a2 is equal to a theta like this. So um, the factor of r that we see here is actually included in the basis vector. So that's why we have to make the adjustment like this. So with this concept in mind, let's go back to our fact sheets and uh, present the results in normalized form. So here's our fact sheet for plane polar coordinates. Let's start with this expression right here. And we have already said that a1 is equal to a r. So b1 is going to equal br as well. But we also said that r a2 um, is going to equal to a theta. And r b2 then is going to equal to b theta like this. So we make uh, this substitution over here. Then we're going to find that the uh, normalized form turns out to be like so. The simplest way to think of it is this. We simply divide this term by the length of the basis vector it represents for each of the two contravariant components. So the basis vector, the z2 basis vector, has a length of r. So if we divide this term by r squared, then we get the corresponding normalized form down here. OK, so with that in mind, let's look at cylindrical polar coordinates. Here, we can convert this to normalized form by dividing each term by the square of the length of the covariant basis vector that corresponds to the term. Well, in cylindrical polar coordinates, z1 is a unit vector. So is z3. But z2 has a length of rho. So we just need to divide the second term by rho squared, and we'll come up with the answer in normalized form like this. So it's a pretty simple conversion once you understand what we're doing. So finally, for spherical polar coordinates, we'll start with this expression. We divide each term by the square of the magnitude of the corresponding covariant basis vector. z1 is a unit vector. z2 has a length of r, so we'll divide this r squared out. The length of z3 is r sine theta. So when we divide by the, that squared, we'll divide that out. And the result is going to be this for the normalized form in spherical polar coordinates. OK, now I want to emphasize that these subscripts are not indexes as we normally think of them. They're simply presented here to keep track of which uh, components we're talking about in normalized form. These uh, elements are not uh, tensor calculus elements. These are not 
covariant uh, components of a vector. They are the normalized components, and therefore this is not a tensor equation, and, and don't don't think of it that way. But this is the result that you'll see published most often. It is the same result as all of this. It's just that all of these are the way we represent it in tensor calculus. This is the way you see it normally presented in mathematical literature. And with that, I think you have a pretty complete understanding of the dot product. So we'll wrap this video up at this point.